Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. And this time I'm going to be reviewing The Dark Knight Rises. This was an absolutely excellent superhero movie, great Batman movie. I enjoyed it a lot. I got a lot to talk to you about with, uh, in regards to this movie. Uh, but before I get into that, a uh, quick apology. I know I promised I would have this review up last night. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize this movie was almost three hours long, and by the time I got out, uh, I just knew I would not have time to record, process, and upload this video and uh, still get to bed at an hour that would let me not be dead on my butt uh, at work the next day. So, small apology for you guys there. But anyway... Uh, let's let's do this thing. I got my notes right here off to the side, so if you see me looking over there a lot, that's what I'm doing. So uh, let's get right into it. Um, first, I'm going to start talking about the characters, and then I will move on and talk about some of the issues that I have, some of the comments that I have in regards to the overall plot of the movie. And uh, before I continue on any further, I need to say... Big, big spoilers here. I am going to talk about, you know, all the big surprises, all the big twists and turns. So, again, if you don't want to be spoiled, you know, turn away now because um, it's full steam ahead from here. So, anyway, uh, let's start with um, let's start with the smaller characters and kind of work our way up. Uh, and I figure that uh, good old Alfred is as good a place as any to start. Uh, Alfred, of course, played by the immensely talented Michael Caine, and he doesn't have a huge role in this movie. I, I think this is actually probably the smallest role that we've seen for Alfred, but he is important to the movie. We again reaffirm that, for all intents and purposes, Alfred is Bruce's adopted father. I mean, not that there was ever any doubt of that. That's been the interpretation of the Alfred-Bruce relationship for decades. And that being the case, it is why Alfred's betrayal of Bruce stings him so hard. And with him burning that letter and not telling him that um, Rachel had chosen Harvey Dent instead of Bruce. Honestly, I found it... Now, I have to say, this is a wonderfully acted scene. Um, I'm going to have to hand that, this scene, of course, that scene where he and Bruce have that big blowout to uh, Michael Caine by quite a long shot. You know, I'm not trying to diss Christian Bale here, but he just really, I just really wasn't feeling the emotion from him that I should think I should have in that scene while Michael Caine just delivered and delivered and delivered. So... Another problem I had with that scene is, frankly, Rachel, I'm just extraordinarily ambivalent in regards to Rachel. Now, I like the character in the previous movie, don't get me wrong. It's just, I knew that it wasn't going to go anywhere. I mean, did anyone really think in the uh, Val Kilmer Batman movie that after that, that Meridian Chase or Chase Meridian or you know whichever version, however you said that woman's name, was going to be a huge and important part of the Batman mythology. No, she was some chick who was created to be the love interest in a crappy Batman movie, and you know Rachel was created to be the love interest in a good Batman movie. But that said, you know, really, did anyone think this was going to last? No. Okay, that's just not how it pans out for Batman in in the romance department, if it ever does pan out. And it's especially going to be. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Batman and romance a little later on. I've got uh, a bit to say about that. But uh, let's get back to Alfred. Um, I really did enjoy that speech that he gave to Bruce about how he never wanted to see him again, but in a good way. It is very in keeping with. With what Alfred has always wanted for Bruce. Time and time again in the comics and the shows, we've seen Alfred basically say to Bruce, like, look, Bruce, you've done enough. You know, put, put the cape and cowl aside. Go be with a nice girl and live a happy, normal life. And, of course, Bruce being Bruce, he can't and he won't. And... This, this leads him to push away 
really the only real human connection that he has left. And I suppose I was going to talk about this later, but I suppose I might as well do it now. Look at how we see Bruce when we start this movie. He's he's puttering around Wayne Manor. He has he's a recluse. No one's really seen him for years. The only human contact he's had has really has is Alfred. And if you're familiar with the show Batman Beyond, this is essentially I mean, no, not essentially. This is exactly how Bruce Wayne ultimately ended up. He ended up a recluse living at Wayne Manor. Alfred, of course, had uh, passed away long before. And the only contact that Bruce Wayne had was a dog. You know, a pretty badass dog, but still a dog. And I can't help but think that the uh, way that we are introduced to Bruce in this movie is a very deliberate nod to the way we saw him when the, he, we were introduced to elderly Bruce Wayne in the show Batman Beyond, which is incidentally a show I highly, highly recommend. So, you know, I got to give Nolan uh, a lot of credit for drawing on that because it is a very, honestly, in terms of storytelling and characterization, a very strong aspect of the Batman mythos in my mind, but one that's just not really been tapped very much. And um, I'm, I'm probably going to have a word or two more to say about Batman Beyond later on. But uh, let's continue on talking about Alfred. Now, after those scenes, the only really major scene that we get with Alfred is at the very end of the movie where he thinks Bruce is dead. And he stands in front of Bruce's grave, which is, of course, next to the, the graves of his parents. And he says to the graves of Thomas and Martha Wayne, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And again, Michael Caine just acts the hell out of that scene. Now, I knew what he was going to say, but really, what other, what else could Alfred say in that circumstance? The Waynes were people that he had dedicated his life to, out of out of genuine respect for them. He genuinely cared about Thomas and Martha Wayne. He respected them as good and decent people, and he was proud to help look after them, and. As he even said, he has been there for Bruce since the very moment he first drew breath. And here he is at the twilight of his life, staring down at the graves of, really, the only real family that he's thought he's ever really had for who knows how long. And he is overwhelmed by the sense of failure. Everything that he has tried to do for the Waynes, for Bruce after he lost his parents, for Bruce when he was Batman, has, as far as Alfred can tell, ended in complete and utter failure. But of course, we get to see the, the happy ending. And, you know, I gotta say, for everyone involved, they sure as heck had earned it. But anyway, uh, let's move on from Alfred to talk about uh, Commissioner Actually, no, let's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this other character later. But let's do talk about Commissioner Gordon. And it, I do think it's sort of interesting and both sad that at the very beginning of the movie, uh, the other, the uh, jerk police officer, I had to check on this, but his name is Foley because I didn't remember it from the movie, is even, you know, sort of cracking wise that, uh, you know, Gordon's going to be out of a job in a couple of months. Uh, the last few years have not exactly been kind to Gordon. He's, of course, been the chief of police and all that. But the guilt of having to lie about the death of Harvey Dent and Batman's heroism has really gotten to him. And I have some mixed feelings about this. Now, granted, the compromises that he's had to make in regards to helping Batman are also a long-established aspect of Commissioner Gordon's character. But, you know, given that Harvey tried to murder his son, I just, I just really feel that Gordon from the comics might not have been tormented by guilt as much as the Gordon of the movies has, especially given the good that this has done. Gotham is as good as it gets as an American city. Now, okay, yes, it is built on a lie, but really, it is also established in the comics that both Gordon and Batman don't like to think 
of Harvey as Two-Face. They like to think of him as Harvey Dent, the good and decent man, their friend. And uh, as I said, I just really think that they took Gordon feeling guilty about building this 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 building this better future for all of Gotham on a lie. I think that in the comics, the com- the Gordon of the comics would have been more at peace with that decision. But it is a it is still a believable aspect of his personality, so I'll let that one slide. Um, one uh, thing that we do get is a mention that uh, Gordon's wife has gone and taken their kids off to Cleveland. Why is it that people always go to Cleveland for some reason when they sort of blow town to go off and never be seen again? Uh, I'm sure that's probably going to get some uh, some of the fans out there, you know, who are like, oh, they were. I was hoping I was going to get to see Batgirl in this movie or something like that. And, I don't know. Um, I'm still a little, honestly, kind of burned out and slightly upset over some of the uh, reaction I saw to um, the very minor role that Barbara had in the last Batman movie. I mean, one of my female friends was just absolutely up in arms that Two-Face chose to kidnap Gordon's son rather than Barbie. And he's like, oh, this is a slap in the face to all the female Batman fans, all of us who grew up loving Batgirl as little girls, and this is an insult to all female comic fans. It's just like, really? You're that upset over over this? I'm sorry. I I realize I'm a guy here, but I, I just don't think... Okay, you know what? That's a, that's um that's an argument from another movie that came out years ago and god knows I don't want to rehash that. So um yeah, given what goes down in this movie, it's honestly a blessing for Gordon that his family has left. And if I actually do remember correctly, there are some stories from the comics, you know, DC Comics continuity is about as fluid as the weather, but there was I, at least one story I remember where it was established that Gordon's family, including Barbara, actually went to Chicago for a while. Or am I getting it mixed up that Gordon was originally from Chicago? Well, in any case, I'm pretty sure there was a story in the comics where they did leave Gordon because of all the stuff that was going on in Gotham and actually went back to Chicago for a while. So I can sort of see this being in tune with that but you know ultimately it's a throwaway line that just sort of is there to explain why Gordon isn't freaking about out about protecting his family when Gotham goes to hell um, now I have from uh, some of the reactions I've seen online I know some people were really kind of confused as to just why uh, Bane sent goons to kill Gordon at the hospital you know seeing as how he really wasn't in much of a position to be a big threat you know, as injured as he was. Well, here's my take on this. Gordon is considered by the people of Gotham City, after Harvey Dent, to be one of the big architects of all the peace and prosperity that Gotham currently enjoys. Bane is there to turn that to ash. And basically, Gordon is a symbol of that prosperity. And he is, as we have seen in the movie, someone that the Gotham City police and the people of Gotham City will rally around in times of trouble. If Bane succeeds in taking out Gordon, that's that's a real blow, symbolically, in terms of morale to all of Gotham. And that's not even counting the fact that Gordon is a really smart guy and, uh, you know, not exactly the no pushover as a cop either. So he's taking out both a symbol and someone who genuinely could, and as we see did, lead some serious resistance to Bane's rule. Um, let's see, let's move on to, yeah, as long as we're talking about the uh, cops in Gotham, let's talk about Foley briefly. Now, as I said, he's the big jerk cop who's just laughing at Gordon being out of a job soon and wants to take down Batman because it's something that Gordon could never do. And... When everything goes to hell, he just wants to bury his head in the sand and just, you know, try and get by and wait for the government to step in. He essentially wants someone else 
to solve Gotham's problems. And this is, of course, the big problem, and not just in the story, but in the real world, is that people wait for other people to solve their problems. They want the government to solve their problems. They want the police to solve their problems. They want the schools to solve the problems that their kids have. And, and you know, the list goes on and on. And, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, I apologize, if I'm, it seems like I'm going off on a political thing here. I, uh, I'm not going to try, I'm going to try and not do that, but I do have some comments uh, in that regard, but I'm going to try and keep that to a minimum. But anyway, so as I said, his thing is that he's the person who just wants other people to solve their problem. Now, granted, Fully has every reason in the world to be afraid. I mean, by the time he uh, does his turnaround, Bane and his gang have literally been terrorizing Gotham for three months. Now, stop and think about that. Like, terrorists have taken over and been in control of a major American city for three months. I mean, that really is, in terms of realism, kind of pushing it, but you can understand, if that's the case, why he is so afraid. And all he really does want to do is make sure that his family is okay. He even tells Gordon, he even reminds Gordon that Bane's goons have been hunting down, you know, the cops who are not trapped in the sewers and killing them like dogs. So Foley does have every reason in the world to be afraid. But Foley is also a policeman. He is someone who has taken an oath to serve and protect Gotham City. And we have seen throughout the movie that Foley has consistently failed in this. All he's done as a police officer has been for his own benefit. He serves and protects only himself. But seeing that Gordon, this man who he has mocked and belittled and looked down on and treated as a joke, is willing to stand up, is willing to you know, lead the charge as dangerous and as desperate as it seems under extraordinarily desperate times is enough to make him, as he even says, put on his dress blues and go out there and take a stand. And this is an aspect of the movie that is important. And it's not just Gordon. It's actually about Batman. It is about what Batman inspires in other people. And for criminals, of course, that is usually, you know, pants wetting terror. But for the good people of Gotham City, for people like Gordon, who, when we first see him in the first, you know, Batman Begins movie, is just struggling to keep his head above water in all the corruption that is drowning the city. Batman does represent some, that people can, that one man can make a difference. That a person can stand up against this corruption, this darkness, this evil. And this person can make a difference. And if enough people stand up against that sort of thing, then they can transform a city. Now speaking of... Uh, Folks along that line, let's talk about um, John Blake. I actually had to look up what his name, his given name was. As best I could tell, he was only ever referred to, except for perhaps once, as just Blake. Now, when I was, let me, let me talk about the feeling I had as I was watching this character go along in the movies. At first, in this movie, I sort of wondered, well, why do we have this character, John Blake? As best I know, and I'm a, I'm a little bit out of Bat, been a little bit out of the Batman comics recently. But as far as I knew, this is not a guy from the comics. He's a completely original character. And while I was watching this, I was like, okay, so if we're going to have this character, why not use one of the many, many Gotham City cops that are established characters in the comics? I was actually really, think, I was even thinking, you know what, Renee Montoya would be an excellent choice to use in this role. And if I could take a step aside for a moment, uh, at the scene at the stock exchange, did you notice the um, the black SWAT team guy? The uh, name tag on there said Allen. Now, I can't help but think that this is intended to be Christmas Allen. Again, a character from the comics who, amazingly enough, actually ends up becoming the Spectre. So I take that as a nod to the comic book fans, which is really quite cool. But anyway, getting back to uh, John Blake. 
And he is there in the story, I realized, to epitomize what I just talked about, about Batman inspiring people to do good. Now, I do have some kind of quibbles with him. And honestly, my main one is that he just, as he, by his own mission, took one look at Bruce Wayne when he was a kid, saw that he was a guy with, who was hiding his anger behind this big, friendly, silently mask, and realized, oh, that guy is secretly Batman. Now, this sort of reads to me like the way Tim Drake figured out Bruce Wayne was Batman. But, honestly, Tim Drake in the comics figured out that Bruce Wayne was Bat Batman based on much, much better evidence than this. This is just Blake taking a wild, crazy guess and, by astonishing coincidence, happening to be right. And that just feels like some seriously weak storytelling to me. Um, if, honestly, I think they could have made it a lot stronger if, do you remember at the end of the f first Batman movie, towards the end, I guess I should say, Batman gives one of his little bat ninja stars to some random kid in the bad part of Gotham? Now, if Blake had said, I was that kid, well, then, yes, he had, would have physically laid eyes on Batman at least once, and then later seeing Bruce Wayne. Having him realize those two people are the same, while still a stretch, would have been much more believable. But anyway, I ended up liking Blake a lot. I thought he was a very strong character, and introducing an original character like him and giving him such a prominent role in this movie is genuinely a big storytelling risk. But uh, David Goyer, the fellow that um, helped write this movie, and incidentally the guy that wrote the Blade wrote, wrote the Blade movies, pulls this off, and he pulls it off really well. So I have to give the writers a lot of credit. They took a big risk, but it really did pay off with the character of John Blake. And frankly, it wouldn't surprise me that if in a couple of years we don't see John Blake probably different he than we see him here in the movies, actually introduced into the Batman comics. So, anyway. Now, Blake's journey is um, ultimately ends with it being heavily implied that at some point in the future, he will take up the mantle of Batman. And they do make it extremely obvious, of course, when it turns out that his real first name is Robin. And if you pay attention during the football game, you can even see the actual Robin symbol on one of the signs, along with some very blatant product placement for Doritos. Well, at least it's not that hugely prominent display, prominently displayed Marlboro cigarette truck from Superman 2. Seriously. Cigarettes? Promoting cigarettes in a Superman movie? Swear to God, Hollywood. But anyway, let's not uh, let's not complain about thirty some year old movies. We've got uh, other things to talk about. Um, honestly, I'm kind of I'm okay with uh, the idea that John Robin John Blake will at some point take over the mantle of Batman. Uh personally, I kind of wish that maybe they if they'd hinted that he would become a Batman-like superhero, but not explicitly refer to himself as Batman, I think that would have been better. Honestly, I think it would be really cool if John Blake became became Nightwing. But, uh, you know what? This is, they're not, this is the end of this particular Batman movie universe. So, really, that's kind of a moot point. So, let's uh, move on, and uh, I will talk about Batman eventually, but let's move on and start talking about the villains. And we might as well talk about our uh, big surprise villain. Yes, Talia al Ghul, a.k.a. Miranda Tate. You know, I really hope you listened to that spoiler warning uh, earlier. But anyway, so... I did mention earlier when I was talking about the character of Chase Meridian or Meridian Chase or whatever the hell her name was, that seeing as how we have Catwoman in this movie, that the whole thing with 
Miranda just was not going to work out. Now, seeing as how they killed Batman's girlfriend in the last movie, I can't. I didn't really think that they were going to go there again. So that kind of led me wondering, well, if they're not going to do that, what are they going to do with her? And I don't know, know what it was, but remember that scene after she and uh, Bruce have sex? There's a shot of some kind of weird scar on her back. And seeing that, I'm like, okay, the camera would not linger on that if it was not in some way important. And if it was important, I never did figure out exactly why. But that told me that, okay, there's something more going on with Miranda than what we're seeing. And then as thing, after everything goes to hell, Bane and the League of Shadows always seem to be one step ahead of the good guys. And after, a while, after pretty quickly on, I realized, okay, as good as the League of Shadows are, to be this constantly ahead of what is going on, they're either going to have to be psychic or they're going to have somebody on the inside who's one of the good guys. And frankly, it ain't going to be Lucius Fox. Miranda was the only person who made sense. But, and again, I will give the writers a lot of credit for this. I just figured her as another member of the League of Shadows. The part where she goes out and explains that she's actually Talia al Ghul, I didn't see coming. And then when it happened, I go, oh, that makes perfect sense. I'm an idiot for not realizing that was go what, was the what they were going to do. So again, I have to give the writers a lot of credit, David Goyer and um, Nolan, who uh, wrote the story together, a lot of credit for just genuinely surprising me. And the really great thing about it was, when I looked back at what I'd seen in the movie, all the clues were there. I just didn't put them together. It all makes perfect sense in retrospect. And that, folks, is how you do a revelation in a movie. Um, but apart from that, I mean, the actress, you know, there's no, I have no problems with the acting. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. I just don't feel that the whole suicide mission really fits with Talia. She's someone who would have wanted to continue on after destroying Gotham, at least based on what uh, of the Talia of the comics. So, she, Talia here didn't really ring very true to me. But she, she, the way they handled her character, it was good. It was surprising. I sure as heck was surprised to see Liam Neeson turn up again as Ra as Rachel Ghoul. Uh, of course, we didn't get to see the Joker again, but that's just because of uh, the unfortunate passing of Heath Ledger. Uh, as long as I'm going down this road, I did get a kick out of seeing the Scarecrow again, but um, it actually took me until seeing him for the second time before I realized, oh, it's Scarecrow rather than it's just some crazy looking guy in a suit. I, I felt, again, I felt kind of dumb for not realizing that was Colin Firth or, you know, whatever his name is. If you've seen my reviews, enough of my other reviews, you've kind of picked up on the fact that I'm really, really bad with names. But anyway... Um, his scene was, you know, it was okay, but we didn't really see anything that was very reminiscent of the Scarecrow in the co in the comics. I mean, again, nothing relating to fear, just him being, I want to send people to, you know, drown by, die by falling through the ice. And I'm going to have some more to say about that later on. But uh, let's wrap the villain aspect of things up and talk about Bane. Uh, I will say that this is probably about as pragmatic an adaptation of Bane as you could possibly do. Just having, I mean, for God's sakes, look at what, what we got in that Batman and Robin movie. I mean, the look was there, but God almighty. So... You know, of course, the luchador mask from the comics and the whole cables sticking out of his body had to go. I do like that they kept the ma made the mask a vulnerability because, you know, one of the vulnerabilities that Bane has in the comics is somebody just outright jerking the uh, venom tubes out of his body. That um, That's something he never reacts well to. But uh, while I did enjoy... 
certain aspects of this take on Bane. Certainly the physicality of Bane, he's just, physically, he is, in every way, a humongous match for Batman. And we do literally get to see him, well, not complete, break Batman's back, essentially, just like he did in the comics. And, you know, that is the thing that Bane became famous for. But... And um, I'm trying to think of the nicest way to say it. Bane's voice is just silly. It just, to me, sounded silly. And, you know, the fact that if you listen, Bane kind of has a rather obvious kind of sort of British accent bleed through more than once. It just doesn't work. Especially seeing as how, in the comics, Bane is from a country called Santa Prista. Now, I don't know if this is ever explicitly spelled out in the comics, but given the name of the place, I would expect Spanish to be Bane's native language. Now, again, we're going with a very, very different version of Bane, so I'm not really upset by that, but I, I don't know. That voice just really, really worked against that the character for me. And, of course, in the comics, Bane is not a member of the League of Shadows, Turning him into one, I think, really does work in the sense of the story. It brings us back to the first movie and, of course, makes Talia's eventual revelation make much, much more sense. So, let's see. Honestly, let's uh, move on to, of course, our main character, who is, of course, Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman. Honestly, I felt like in many ways he was... The, one of the weakest characters in this movie. Now, not that he doesn't have cool mo- has some cool moments. You know, a lot of what we see in the uh, the prison in you know God only knows where it is, probably someplace in the Middle East, given that uh, the the history of Ra's al Ghul. You know, there's some really nice moments there. There was, of course, some you know you know cool Batman one-liners. You know, even some funny moments, but. It just really sort of felt like, in a way, I guess it really just sort of felt like Batman was a guest star in his own movie. It, well, there are a lot of good moments. It just doesn't really feel like, to me, as if Batman was the main character. Batman was more like one of an ensemble cast who had his good moments, But, you know, this movie is called The Dark Knight Rises. I came to this movie to watch Batman do stuff. And as great as the story was, and as great as all the other stuff that the other characters did, this movie just plain needed more Batman. And uh, last, but certainly not least, we have the character of Catwoman. Um, I know the costume when we first, uh, the first picture of it turned turned up online, a lot of people were kind of grinning with some, like, eh... Or we're just upset about it. Frankly, I don't really have a problem with this. The, the cat uh, aspect of it was very, very subtle. And honestly, that makes sense. The Catwoman, she never even refers to herself as Catwoman. She is. Uh, it is mentioned that her nickname is The Cat, which is actually in keeping with the comics. When Catwoman first appeared way back in the 40s, she actually was just called The Cat. The whole cat she did, wasn't she started. They did not start referring to her as Catwoman until a couple of years later. And uh, the outfit, um, strangely enough, it seemed very reminiscent of you know, the Julie Newmar, Lee Mayweather, uh, Eartha Kitt Catwoman costume from the '60s, especially when she uh, would you know had on the mask. And it is sort of surprising to see that they would go there with that for that. But honestly, I'm, I'm okay with that one because it's it's a great costume. You know, as silly as goofy as the, the 60s uh, Batman show is, you can't really deny it did very much embody that era of the Batman mythology. Uh, and the, I, I absolutely love the, the actors who played all the classic Batman villains here. They were at, they were clearly just having an absolute ball going going along with just how crazy and wacky that show was. So, I do like that they they kind of kept it 
very grounded. It really did feel like she was a jewel thief who just happened to pick up the name, the cat. It wasn't something that she chose for herself. Because really, you know, the only person who, for most of the story, Selena thinks about is herself. And we do get some vague hint that she seems to care about that girl who she hangs around her apartment and, as best I can tell, doesn't actually seem to have a name and is more than once implied to be a prostitute. Now, amazingly enough, this is actually also in keeping with the comics. There are some interpretations of Catwoman's origin that have her having spent time as... Well, a hooker and a dominatrix, especially during the 90s when, you know, Catwoman used a whip as her primary weapon. Uh, needless to say, the whole Catwoman used to be a hooker interpretation is uh, not terribly popular with the fans nowadays. But it is, uh, it has been more than once referred to in the comics that Catwoman is very protective towards prostitutes and is more than happy to deal out a little vigilante justice to guys who abuse prostitutes. So I get the feeling that that was, um, that was something that was being nodded to here. I really can't say that's, uh, I would consider that a wise choice, but on the other hand, that is for most of the movie about as close as we get to seeing Catwoman giving a damn about anybody but herself. Uh, let me see here. Looking at my notes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I did like that they did several times give us examples of how Selina is indeed a match for Bruce. You know, she manages to steal jewels from Wayne Manor. She even pulls that mysterious disappearance on Batman. And that line where he goes, so that's how it feels. That was, that was pretty darn funny. And actually reminiscent of a scene from uh, the comic books uh, from this really great uh, miniseries called Kingdom Come where um, an older Bruce Wayne who uh, gets around on a cane and uses exoskeletal power armor kind of thing, just like we see in the here, is uh, having a conversation with Superman. Superman asks him for help and Batman basically tells him to shove off. He turns around to get something, and when he gets looks back, Superman's gone, and Batman just says, "So that's how it feels," or so that that's so that's what it's like. And I'm actually really embarrassed how many times I had to read that scene before I realized what he was talking about. Again, I I, I felt really dumb there. So um, let me see. I I do have to wonder where exactly did Catwoman learn to drive super crazy motorcycles that I'm not. 100% sure could actually exist in the real world. I'm going to assume that motorcycles like that do exist somewhere. I mean, they certainly don't seem entirely out of the realm of possibility, but I've sure as heck never seen one. And until I watched this movie, I never even heard of them. So, again, where is it that Catwoman learned to drive one of those things? And, um, honestly, I found this whole... Catwoman is a supporter of the 99%, you know, Occupy Wall Street. Eh, you know, one Catwoman is many things, but someone who's political, it, it just does not ring true to me as a character. But I guess that was thrown in there so that she would have some, some a, a, a motivation to sort of really step in and want to defend Gotham because you know this is a nice example of be careful what you wish for she even talks about you know you'll wonder how you could ever live so large and live so leave so little for the rest of us well then she gets to see what happens when the people who have been oppressed and in this case these people are the violent in you know evil sociopaths locked up in Bratgate prison go out on a rampage and, you know, suddenly the whole thing of, you know, the people who haven't been getting their due turning on the wealthy and the powerful isn't so great when you realize that sort of thing involves, you know, murder and, well, let's be realistic here, you know, murder, rape, just turning Gotham City into an absolute hellhole. 
you know, obviously, and we see this, you know, people are being murdered, you know, children are based, are doubtlessly seeing horrible things happen to their parents right in front of them. Doubtlessly horrible things are happening to children. I mean, we even see Catwoman having to rescue a kid from some guys who are, at the very best, going to give the kid a serious beating for stealing food from them. At worst, they're probably going to murder him. So, again, and there are many examples of this sort of thing happening through history where, you know, the oppressed underclass rises up and basically goes out and kills a whole lot of people whose only real crime is being wealthy. And, you know, again, not to get really political here, but being wealthy is not a crime. And just because you have wealth doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And it doesn't mean that you stepped on someone to get that. There are plenty of people in this world who have made their money honestly. And hating someone just because they have money does not put you on the moral high ground. Good people can be good, can be wealthy, middle class, or poor. And just so can bad people. And that is where I'm going to leave it. Uh, that, let's, um, and uh, now let's move on to my last uh, comment on the story of Catwoman. And this is her obsession with the whole clean slate, you know, your past sticks with you. Selena, for God's sakes, if you're really this upset about that sort of thing, just move your, just change your name and move to Iceland. Eventually, people are just going to quit looking for you. Seriously, move, or you know, if you don't like that, move to some like little hick town in Finland. All right, they're they're probably not going to find you. And you know, even if you get this clean slate, given your basic nature. You're still going to always be looking over your shoulder. You're never going to be comfortable not doing that. So just accept it and start over fresh somewhere. Don't obsess over some stupid little magical clean slate that people can and do use to manipulate you. You're supposed to be smarter than that. Uh, let me see here. Okay. So let's move on and talk about uh, some of the issues I have with the, the storyline here. Uh, first of all, the whole, uh, and I'm, 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 when I say issues, I actually don't mean bad things. These are just things I want to talk about. The whole thing with Bane blowing the bridges and Gotham City being cut off from the rest of the world. This is very obviously an influence from the famous Cataclysm storyline in the comic books where Gotham City is devastated by an earthquake. The U.S. government does the math and realizes we can't afford to fix Gotham. So, And Gotham was even retconned to being on two islands where previously it had been established as being attached to the mainland United States. So in the comics what the government does is they give everybody a deadline and say, if you're not out of Gotham by then, we're going to blow all the bridges, cut all the access that Gotham has to the rest of the world, and then declare that Gotham City is no longer a part of the United States, and if you're still there, you're SOL. And even the creators of the comic said, like, well, if this were to happen in the real world, they wouldn't probably wouldn't do that. But we think this is a cool story, so we're going to do it anyway. And to be perfectly fair... Cataclysm was a pretty darn cool story. But, yeah. It's just, um, it's very convenient that uh, that works out. And if you really stop and think about it, if Gotham really was built on an island like that, where it's that far away from the mainland, why would anybody back in the olden times have actually settled there? You know, one of the things about Manhattan is that which, of course, is a big, big influence on Gotham, is that it's not an island. I mean, people do, of course, refer to it as Manhattan Island all the time. But Manhattan is, in fact, a peninsula. It is surrounded on three sides by water, whereas an island is, of course, surrounded on all sides by water. That's why, that's part of the reason why New York is as successful a city as it is. You know, we don't really build major cities... I mean, you know, I, I'm actually going to leave it there. I'm sure somebody's going to quote me some examples of very large cities that are, in fact, laid out like that. 
you know, maybe my fault thinking is faulty there. I'm just going to let that one slide. Uh, another thing that was interesting, they mentioned that Gotham has a population of 12 million. Now, New York actually, and I looked this up, has a population of 8 million. Now, this actually might be in keeping with the differences between our world and the movie-verse. The President of the United States even refers to Gotham as our greatest city. So, if in the Nolan universe, Gotham is actually larger and, amazingly enough, more prominent in American culture than New York is, then okay, I can buy that. Otherwise, they were either talking about, you know, the New York, the greater Gotham area, which would, you know, be the suburbs that are basically be everything that are not on that I those I that island. But if that's the case, then a lot of it would actually not be in danger from Bane. It's just the island of Gotham that is in danger. But uh, doubtlessly, I'm overthinking all of this. So uh, let's uh, talk about this some more, though. So. I'm really led to, we're really supposed to believe that there's no other way except for those bridges to get off that. I mean, really, last I checked, there's all kinds of tunnels and stuff going all over New York. Now, granted, you can say, like, okay, Bane's guys, you know, close those all up and stuff. But, I don't know, it just seems like maybe they should have acknowledged that in some way. And a big thing they sure as heck acknowledge is, threat or no threat, when you tell millions of people packed into a small area that there's a nuclear bomb that might go off, no matter what threat you make, some of those people are going to panic. And even if it means maybe getting themselves blown up, they're going to bolt for it. it. You know, Screw getting blown up by the bomb. Screw getting shot by the cops. Screw getting shot by the army. People are dumb. Some people are just going to panic and make a run for it no matter what. And... You know, hey, maybe that happened and the police or the army shot them all dead and it was just never acknowledged. But if that's the case, boy, shouldn't somebody have said something about that? And if people did run, okay, wouldn't, no matter how much the army or the police are shooting at them, you'd think that if a whole bunch of people, like thousands of people, which was almost certainly what would happen in the real world, that some of them would make it. Okay? Yeah, I mean, even with the, you know, the Stormtrooper-esque shooting that we saw from some from a lot of people in this movie, some of them are going to make it. And if that happens, then Bane's threat is proven to be a bluff. But again, we just kind of have to go along with this for the, for the plot to unfold the way it does. So, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. Let's talk about the whole thin ice thing. You know, it watching that, I was just thinking, okay, how dumb are these people? Now, maybe I'm the only person who paid attention to those PSAs at the end of all those cartoon shows that I watched growing up as a kid. But I know that if you were trying to ca cross some ice, and again, I learned this from cartoon shows that I watched as a kid, if you are trying to cross what you think is thin ice, you don't like treat it like it's it's like the ground. You don't physically walk across it. You lay down and you know sort of shimmy on like on your belly, like you're uh, doing a crawl through uh, like they teach like, like the way they teach soldiers to crawl through trenches in the army. Again, I learned this from cartoons as a kid. I think uh, I think yeah I think I learned this from like one of the GI Joe PSAs. So, if I know this, why the heck do none of these other adults, you know, mature, rational people know this? I mean, it really, was. am I just the only person who actually paid attention to those? And even a smart guy like Commissioner Gordon doesn't seem to think to do this. Now, granted, maybe the Scarecrow's goons just shot anybody who tried to do that. But... Gee, you know, you'd think somebody would know in that situation that's what you're supposed to do. And the reason that works is because if you're standing, you're putting all of your weight in a very small area. If you lay down, you're distributing your weight and the ice can hold you better. The more you know. And um, let me see here. 
Ah, uh, yeah, the whole plane crash at the very beginning. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the heck was going on in Bane's mind there. Okay, first of all, he takes some of the blood from the scientist guy and injects it into this dead body. Now, I assume he's doing this so that if they perform a DNA test, it will read as the DNA of the dead scientist. Okay, I'm pretty sure if you don't, if you just pour some of your, pump some of your blood into the body of another person, that's absolutely no guarantee that if they do a DNA test on that person's remains, even after a plane crash, that it's going to positively identify that person as you. In fact, that's so ridiculously unlikely, I can't believe they actually tried to sell me this. Either that or I grossly misinterpreted what that scene was supposed to be about. And um, if that's the case, and, Bat and uh, Bane has access to the bodies of, you know, people who can't be identified through their dental records, presumably, why leave that one guy on the plane? Why not just get some random corpse, that sh another random corpse that, you know, can't be tied to you, and, you know, keep yourself up one extraordinarily loyal henchman? Again, I get the imp this is the and this is the impression I get here that they don't know who the guy that the the goon on the plane is. They don't know that he's a member of the League of Shadows. So if they just substitute some other random person, again, how are the authorities going to know? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but again, this is just stuff that occurs to me. And we see that the um body of the plane is dragged along carried by the other plane in a bunch of stuff that I'm very sure is extraordinarily just w not possible given the laws of aerodynamics and physics and a bunch of other stuff, but we'll let go that go. So the the body of the, the main cabin and stuff of all the plane is going to be found miles and miles and miles and miles away from where the wings and the tail and all that and all that the wings and the front part of the plane and all that other stuff are going to be. So unless the CIA or the FAA or whoever investigates that plane crash are the biggest idiots to have ever walked the face of the earth, they're going to look at that and go, hey, there's something extraordinarily fishy about this plane crash. And, you know, maybe they did, but do that and they just never put together that you know, there was something wrong with the dead bodies, but still, I mean, you know, come on here. Something, whatever. Okay, so uh, one other uh, nod to the comics that we got here was uh, the character of John Daggett. Now, this is, of course, a nod to the character of Roland Daggett from the, the uh, Batman the Animated Series from the 90s. I'm just not really sure why they felt the name to need to change his name to John rather than Roland. I mean, granted, Roland's not really a very common or popular name, but there's nothing wrong with it. And if you're going to do a shout out to a character, you know, go all the way. And um, so let me get this straight with Blackgate Prison. One, they're actually going to put a woman in the cell with the, the area with men. I mean, look, I'm sorry. I don't care how badass they consider Catwoman to be or, you know, that's the fact that she busted some guy's wrists. No cops on the face of God's green earth in, 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 in a civilized developed nation are going to put a woman in the men's general population area of a prison, even if she does have a cell entirely to herself. That's called... You know, putting a spark right next to a powder keg. I mean, have you ever seen that footage of TV of what happens if a female reporter goes into a prison? The male prisoners just go absolutely bonkers. I mean, for God's sake, you could have just said that they put Cat Catwoman in solitary. And that said, why are they keeping all of these guys, these all of these incredibly dangerous guys, in a jail in the middle of the city? Now, presumably, if this is in keeping with the Black Gate of the Prison, this is where guys who are going to be there for like 20, 30 years are going to be locked up. Now, look, I'm not going to be claim to be a big expert on prisons throughout the United States, 
but it is established in the comics that Blackgate Prison is actually also on an island out in Gotham Harbor. So it makes sense that they would use that. I mean, it's I mean it's very obviously based on Rikers Island that New York uses, which is in fact an actual island. The now I get that maybe they were trying of going for this being a riff on the very the famous jail in New York City that's uh, nicknamed the Tombs. But the Tombs is really, as I understand it, and I freely admit I could be wrong on this. I'm not an expert. As I understand it, the the tombs is not the place where they lock people up for like 30 years. That's what Rikers is for. The tombs is a jail. It's where they keep people for like who are waiting for trial, people who are going to be there for, you know, not not years and years and years at a time. Now again, I might be mistaken on this, but this just seems like an incredibly a, a real stretch of reality because you know those prisons where they do keep people for years and years and decades and decades, they generally tend to build those sort of out of the way in generally out of the way places like Rikers on islands near major cities or just sort of out in the, out in the fields or the deserts or someplace like that. Uh, there's actually a prison not super far from my hometown and it's built kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Although the prisoners do there on three sides have a spectacular, spectacular view of a very large landfill. So, yeah. So, yeah, it just seems like they do that so that Bane has easy access to an army of sociopaths for the cops to fight in a very stirring but very lacking in tactics fight. But, of course, that fight was really about making a statement, about symbolism, about the Gotham City police taking back Gotham. Also, did you notice that they couldn't really seem to consi be consistent with whether or not the Gotham Police is abbreviated GCP or GCPD? I noticed that. Well, anyway, folks, I've been talking for about an hour here, so I think it's time to wrap things up. Overall, this is, despite all the complaints I've made about this movie, this is a movie that has some flaws, but it is far, far overshadowed by the really strong plot, a lot of the really great acting, and overall just being not just a good Batman movie, but just plain being a really good movie. When I walked out of there, I was feeling pumped and charged. I had watched one of the best movies I had seen in a long time, and that is exactly what I wanted from this film. So, yeah, a lot of credit to everybody who helped put this movie together, they have made a truly, not just a truly great Batman movie, but just a truly great movie in general. So that said, as always, folks, please comment, rate, and subscribe. You can, of course, follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi. And until next time, take care and have a good one.